all colleagues um, and guests also online. Um, you're very welcome to panel two at the IDM. And for those who are here in person, thank you very much for braving <laughs> the very gray weather um, to be here. We are, we're, we're deeply appreciative. And just before I go into the panel proper, I just want to bring your attention to the screen. Oh, it's gone. Yes, there it is. Um, this screen, which is actually um, IOM's policy paper um, to COP27 on climate-induced um, displacement and uh, migration. You can download it with the um, QR code, and it has a whole set of uh, recommendations um, regarding this very important issue, which of course is the basis for the IDM overall. But now in this panel, which I have the honor and privilege to moderate, we are going to, within this overall frame of climate-induced migration um, and displacement, we're going to examine the role of women and youth in mitigating the impact of climate change-driven food insecurity on migration and displacement. I'm very privileged to be joined by a, a really distinguished um, panel. And just before we start, I'd like to highlight that globally, nearly one in three women experienced moderate or severe food insecurity last year. Rising food prices and climate change are likely to exacerbate hunger around the world, and we're reaching a tipping point. On one hand, we have the adverse effects of climate change and its impact on the environment that are increasingly driving migration and displacement in all regions of the world. According to the World Bank, up to 216 million people across six regions could move within their countries by 2050. And on the other hand, we're facing rising inflation and supply chain disruptions, including critical food and agricultural supplies, due in part to the war in Ukraine, with the knock-on effects for cost of living that hit the most vulnerable people, including women and young people the hardest. Women, especially those from poor and marginalized communities, are disproportionately affected by climate change and environmental degradation, including its oceans and forests. Their vulnerability stems from their limited access to and control of land and environmental goods, exclusion from decision-making, unpaid work, especially in agricultural production and trade, and the higher likelihood of living in poverty. Overcoming multiple challenges affecting households' welfare resulting from an interplay of climate change and economic hardship is not possible without engaging women who play a central role in land management and food provision and considering the vulnerabilities of youth and children. This panel will examine the role that gender and age-sensitive agricultural and trade policies continue playing in addressing climate change-driven food insecurity, as well as into some initiatives aimed at tackling risks associated with migration and displacement. And now, we have three speakers. First will be Rachel Snow of the Population and Development Branch at the UN Population Fund, who is joining us online followed by Mr. Abdi Hakim Ante, Senior Advisor, Government of Somalia, and last but not least, Ms. Adriana Quinones, Director AI of the Geneva Liaison Office for UN Women. And each of the speakers is going to focus on one of four questions, or maybe a combination of, and the questions are, what challenges remain to improving women's involvement in land management and food provision in the context of climate change, and how could these be overcome? 
The second question is how can gender sensitive agricultural and trade policies help tackle emerging food insecurity issues and resulting migration and displacement patterns facing most vulnerable countries and regions? Third, what are the opportunities for youth to contribute to measures that address climate change and food insecurity and avert or minimize displacement? And what risks do such factors as precarious food supply, agricultural market fluctuation, and climate-induced displacement carry for household members' welfare, in particular, that of women, children, and youth, and how can gender and age-inclusive policies, access to finance, technology, and training, help mitigate these? And so we look forward to a very interesting remarks by our panelists, after which we will have um, questions uh, from the floor. And without further ado, I would like to call on Ms. Rachel Snow. And uh, full disclosure, I used to work at uh, the UN Population Fund. So Rachel is a former colleague and a dear friend. So it's great pleasure for me personally um, to now give her the floor and respond um, to the questions. Rachel? Well, first of all, thank you so much, um, Ugo. It's really a pleasure to be here on behalf of UNFPA. And um, these are complicated questions <laughs> and, and very much uh, interwoven one, one with another. So, so I'll be delighted to kick us off, but uh, I, I fear I will not answer all four questions and, and look to my colleagues uh, for, for a discussion. I think, first of all, um, one of the, the striking uh, phenomena for me has been to recognize how many women uh, are engaged in, in agricultural labor in the world. And, and the estimates are somewhere between 35, 40% of all rural agricultural labor in the world is undertaken by women. And globally, maybe half of all food production um, is something which, for which women are, are responsible. But in developing countries, that, that rises and, and can be anywhere between 60 as much as 80% in, in given countries. So the role of women in, in you know, mitigation against food insecurities is enormous, uh, the potential role here. At the same time, as you have already just said, what we find in, in the context of food insecurity is that women are more food insecure than men on every continent from, from which we have uh, reasonable data. And, and that seems to be the case even in, um, in both humanitarian crises, but at the same time it's also the case in non-crises situations uh, where poverty uh, rears its head. And this is true for women irrespective of whether they may be pregnant uh, or breastfeeding. So the both engagement of women in, in agriculture is high, and at the same time, when food is insecure, it is women in households who are frequently the most uh, insecure of all. The other extension of that, of course, is that, is that because of women's role uh, and involvement in the feeding of, of their family and small children, uh, where women are, are food insecure, children under five are food insecure. So again, we have this compounding of the phenomena of both being heavily engaged in food production, yet food insecure, and indeed uh, where, where women are, our children are food insecure. When it comes to migration, I think we see both um, that food insecurity is a driver of migration, and at the same time, of course, uh, migration can, can lead to food insecurity. One of the a recent phenomena from a, a study we conducted in three gateway cities of, of West Africa very recently, where young international migrants uh, were, were languishing, waiting, and unable to progress onward. And, and a study that, that, that discussed uh, these issues with about 1,200 of those um, young people. After desperate need for financial support, food security was, was the number two issue um, in terms of where interventions could make a great difference to their circumstance and well-being. So we know that with particularly climate change and disruptions of agriculture, we have loss and movement of people. At the same time, uh, when people are on the move, 
uh, particularly young people, we're seeing food insecurity as a major concern. And moving to climate change, uh, and, and I want to say that, that, that the last two years, the Commission on Population and Development uh, has featured issues of population, food insecurity, and nutrition as the theme of the Commission on Population and Development. So it's very useful to go, for anyone interested in these interrelated issues, it is useful to go back and look at the reports of the Secretary General uh, in the last two Commissions on Population and Development. And, and there, of course, indeed, again, climate change comes, uh, comes in, and what, what's evident is the tremendous risk to uh, subsistence agriculture in light of the, the projected changes we can expect uh, if things do not reverse direction fairly soon in terms of the climate crisis. Uh, and one of the most devastating of those is the expectations of heat and drought uh, and the millions, and, and it's hundreds of millions, are potentially uh, to be displaced by, by as early as 2050 and certainly by 2100 if the, the direction of the climate change continues. So the potential of those displacements I, I hope will be a, a major factor of this discussion because I, I must say uh, from a population uh, policy perspective, I think one of the, the deeply and concerning issues is the uh, kind of resistance to uh, migration and, and, and the concerns and anxieties uh, that follow from, from mass movements. But at the same time, the very realistic likelihood that um, habitability of the environment and is going to worsen and that we are in the near next coming decades, we are gonna see a, a growing number of people who, who simply have to be relocated um, for well-being. So I'm gonna stop there um, and turn back to you and I look forward to, to another round and, and discussions uh, following uh, my, co my colleagues' interventions. Thank you so much, Hugo. Thank you very much, Rachel, for those remarks um, and really highlighting the very unfortunate vicious circle between um, uh, food insecurity as a driver of migration and yet at the same time migration causing um, food insecurity as well as you know, the specific impact on women given their role in the agricultural sector and in decision making at home when it comes to um, nutrition and what this then means um, for, for children. And now, uh, so thank you again, Rachel. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Ante, who is really going to focus on what the opportunities are for youth to contribute to measures addressing climate change and food insecurity to avert and minimize displacement. You have the floor. <clears throat> uh, a very good afternoon to all of you, and thank you so much, um, uh, IOM, for um, for hosting us, uh, me and, and my colleague, uh, early in the morning, and thank you um, as well um, for moderating, and also my predecessor, Ms. Rochelle. Uh, so I, I'm going to speak um, uh, in the context uh, of Somalia, but broadly with the role of uh, women and youth um, in the um, in the in the title of uh, the climate change and the, the food security uh, context. Um, so, as you know, um, you know Somalia is one of the biggest countries that are suffering uh, the result of the climate deprivation and the climate uh, crisis. Uh, early in the morning, we had our uh, envoy speaking on the. Uh, the climate uh, uh, crisis in Somalia, as we are right now facing a looming famine that is putting nearly 7 million uh, Somalis uh, at, at an acute uh, risk, and also uh, spreading all uh, uh, East Africa and Horn of Africa in particular. So, um, um, so um, in, in Somalia, um, there, there can be no development and peace or sustainable food security in Somalia if we leave the half of the population, which are women and youth in Somalia. Nearly 75% of the entire population of Somalia are below the age of 30 years old. 
um, in Somalia and globally, one out of in 10 uh, people are facing uh, food uh, insecurity. They don't have a food on their table. This is really adding and exacerbating further on the, uh, on the situation that uh, the youth, which is the bulk of the country, are facing. Somalia and our neighborhood country, we are in the midst of a climate emergency and escalating hunger uh, crisis. The worst drought that, is, uh, that ever happened in the continent in 40 years are now causing a failure of a, a four season of a rain failure, which as a result was also putting um, four million of the livestock at risk and seven million people at a severe malnutrition, including youth and, uh, and particularly women and children. Around, uh, around half of our population are food insecure and more than one million people, the majority of, of whom are women and children and elderly, have been displaced uh, during this uh, uh, catastrophic drought and humanitarian crisis. Somalia is now deemed as uh, or projected as a famine prone uh, situation as the panel of the UN experts have already uh, declared some part of the country uh, prone to famine. Although the crisis that is raging in our country, we cannot ignore and develop the resilience building, including support targeting the specific needs of rural and displaced women and youth. Uh, however, even if we manage to end the current crisis, we will be back here again in a year or two, appealing to international community for support while women and young people and the elderly are the worst hit and living a very acute, malnourished, and vulnerable conditions. Therefore, we need policies that include women and young people and putting the youth at the center of a gravity, at the center of the decision-making body, so that they can reclaim and they can also uh, champion their own uh, future and destination. Protecting the food protect, uh, our food production and distribution from uh, weather events begins with the climate resilience infrastructure. That also includes empowering the youth and women uh, and giving the opportunity that they need. Our country, uh, our country and my country, Somalia, needs a meaningful investment in modern infrastructure, technology, and, tra and training um, that can enable and empower women and youth so that they can have the access and the capacity to unleash their potentials and their power. With innovation, uh, uh, with innovative uh, practices and policies, our domestic food production will be less uh, will, will be less weather sensitive, increasing national food security and livelihoods, and reducing resilience on import and vulnerability. As they say very famously, there is no quick fix in uh, in Somalia nor in in, in Horn of Africa. We need a long-term solution that looks. Uh, Somalia and the Horn of Africa through the lens of a long-term solution. We therefore uh, appeal uh, uh, both the international uh, partners such as the, the, this forum uh, having and giving the youth the voice that they are uh, uh, acutely needed. In conclusion to my remarks, and I am also, uh, as I also provide a time to time advice to the office of the president as well as of the office of the president uh, of the prime minister, the youth and the role of their uh, uh, in, in the society is much more important and much more acutely, uh, more than ever, especially when they are now the 75 of the populations. Therefore, we are um, we acknowledge and recognize uh, the importance of their role, but this their role can only be more meaningful and tangible once we unleash their potentials and give the opportunity that they deserve more. Uh, therefore, part of my role also includes speaking to youth in the diaspora. Uh, I'm also advising to the, uh, the special envoy, and we've been traveling extensively throughout North America and Europe over the last one month, and meeting uh, numerous of diaspora, mainly youth, and appealing to them and telling them how can we galvanize and ensure that youth sit at the table, uh, not only on the policy decision, but also in the climate, uh, in the climate uh, discussions uh, as well. The government has uh, a an, an dedicated minister of youth whose mandate is to ensure uh, women and youth and the vulnerable community are not 
only included in the decision-making bodies, but also they have given a voice so that they can voice out uh, their voice both at the uh, national and international level. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that I think uh, it's very timely to have this kind of discussions and the youth should be uh, given the opportunity that they need uh, so that they can um, better harness their, uh, their, uh, their opportunity. And uh, I look forward to having a, a, a lively discussion and interactive uh, uh, conversation with the, with the rest of the panel and the, the participants. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Ante, for your remarks. Thank you for um, bringing into focus the issue of solutions and long-term um, solutions. Also, the role of diaspora um, in this. I want to also highlight, based on my recent visit, not to Somalia, but actually to South Sudan, where I met with women who were um, displaced from an area um, seasonally affected by floods and their requests for capacity building in terms of change in livelihoods so that they could have more climate resistant um, livelihoods and you know this speaks to the point you made about voice and meaningful engagement um, of women um, and youth um, in the solutions that they need and also to highlight the, the critical importance of adaptation because the point, uh, the, the data point I mentioned earlier, uh, 216 people potentially could move by, by 2050, is also followed by the data point that 80% of that can be averted if countries uphold Paris agreements and invest in adaptation. And I, again, another plug for um, the policy paper, which really speaks to the importance of investments in adaptation as part of the solution for people to, to stay um, as well. So thank you, thank you very much. And now I'm going to move to Ms. Quinones um, for, her, for her remarks, which are going to focus on gender sensitive um, policies, um, again, opportunities um, for youth and women to avert and minimize displacement, as well as the risks of uh, such factors as the precarious food supply and uh, market fluctuations, and what this means for welfare of the household. And so, Ms. Quinones, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and thank you to IOM for this important convening and opportunity to bring the topics that we're all working on, but through a gender and intergenerational perspective, which is much needed. As we know, climate and environmental emergencies coupled with conflict and the COVID pandemic have had an accelerated and intensified um, interlinked crisis. Even in times of peace, women around the world tend to be more food insecure than men, but amid conflict and crisis entrenched, gender inequalities mean that women and girls often eat less and last, and their nutritional needs may be sidelining, deepening hunger and malnutrition and poverty. Some of the historical needs of women and girls have yet to be met. For example, the unequal access and control over land over other productive resources and a greater dependency on natural resources for their livelihoods affect women's abilities to adapt and uh, lead on, on a path to a new creation of a new economy for them to increase their household income. While migration may be an opportunity for increased autonomy and independence, it also exposes them to various labor and human rights violations, including sexual and gender-based violence. A lack of safe and regular migration pathways, including pathways on spe specific to climate change, may increase the risk of violence against women and girls and turn into more dangerous and irregular channels when they face greater likelihood of experiencing violence by the police and border, border officials, intimate partners and other migrants, and increase the risk in trafficking in persons. And we often tend to think of these, all these issues in silos, but they are all closely related. 
Um, we must ensure that women and girls have access to decent work, social protection, and productive resources as part of a people-centered economy that addresses inequalities between and within countries. And so what this has meant in many countries where we hope to be collaborating, including with IOM and governments, are financial inclusion um, mechanisms for products targeting the needs of women in specific situations. We are often seeing that the traditional products are just uh, not responding to women's and girls' needs. We need conditional tra uh, cash transfers that do not um, include a burden of more work for women uh, in the household, but rather increased in decision-making but in sharing of responsibilities. Um, we, we should work to include women's products in international markets through anchor enterprises so that they can be providers of inputs of higher uh, level uh, products that can have sustainable income for them. We see a lot of support, for example, for entrepreneurship, but not necessarily the placing of the products that women cooperatives make, uh, for example, in international markets for sustained livelihoods. We need to end discriminatory legislation. There are still countries around the world where women cannot inherit land if they, don't, if they are not married or without the permission of their husbands. Um, we need to uh, increase uh, the, our efforts in gender just green transitions that may be harnessed to create decent jobs, new jobs for women, especially those in care, energy, agriculture, and natural resource management. Um, also, we work to prioritize women's leadership and participation. It is essential to know the experiences of women and girls, women who are uh, living in a situation of migration, but also harness the knowledge and the experience of indigenous women, Afro-descendant women that have been so successful in conserving the environment, in, in increasing the knowledge of how to sustain livelihoods in a way that doesn't damage our existing opportunities. Um, and I want to say that we have found that women human rights defenders, uh, defenders of the environment, have been suffering increased attacks even to their life. In 2020 alone, 331 people were killed defending light, uh, land, the rights of indigenous peoples, and environmental rights. So we need to look at all these issues together to prioritize and expand access to safe and regular migration pathways, including for people moving because of climate change and food insecurity, specifically targeting this aspect of migration, making sure that protection of migrant women and their families is at the center. Um, we want to say, we want to share with you um, some of our initiatives uh, based on the Generation Equality Forum that was launched last year with the support of the governments of France and Mexico, where the promise of more opportunities, leadership, agency, increased resources in decision-making for women and girls um, is deemed to require many years to be achieved. And so we have a coalition on women's economic empowerment where we are looking at what could be financial integration for women in situations of extreme vulnerability and what would it look like to have uh, trade uh, through tariffs, through incentives, where women can be positioning their products in markets that enable them to have um, increased incomes and sustainable livelihoods. We need to work at the personal level with participatory leadership. At the community level, changing, shifting social norms that impede women's participation at the political and economic realm. At the institutional level, so that when women come to request services that adapt to their needs, they are treated with dignity, respect, and a positive response. And then policy change, tariffs, global commitments that we should all, especially in Geneva, work together to be achieving at country level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Quinonez. Um, you know, we often talk about women and children or young people as being vulnerable, but it's very clear from your remarks that it's the context that makes them vulnerable, not that 
in and of themselves, they are vulnerable. And you really highlighted very comprehensively the issues around weak access to resources such as land, risk and exposure to gender-based violence, as well as discriminatory legislation, social norms, cultural norms, institutional barriers, a whole range of issues that make women and young people um, vulnerable. And at the same time, thank you for highlighting the um, point of having increased opportunities to move safely through regular pathways for migration, which we at IOM see as part of the solution for people who will move. And uh, migration being an adaptation strategy for um, climate change and therefore um, the importance of such migration being safe and, and regular. So thank you, thank you very much um, for your remarks. And now um, I turn to colleagues, um, excellencies in front of me as well as those online for the interactive um, discussion and questions to our panelists who have given us a lot of food for thought um, and laying out very comprehensively the range of issues as well as the what the solutions um, need to be. And so with that, the floor is open. We have one uh, uh, intervention that was uh, recorded. This is Holly C. would like to intervene. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. So happy to see you moderating this session. In the earlier session today, I express words of solidarity and good wishes to the good people of Nigeria, especially in the South, who have been experiencing these harsh um, floods, um, displacing millions of people. Madam Deputy Director General, the specific topic of this panel offers the opportunity to focus our attention on the impact of climate change driven food insecurity on migration and displacement. In this regard, the Holy See wishes to recall that the protagonists of such migration and displacement are not mere numbers or statistics, but rather human persons who are often forced to make life-saving decisions. In this regard, Pope Francis has affirmed that to see or not to see the effects of climate change on displacement is the question that should lead us to the answer in action together. Indeed, the human reality of migration and the ubiquity of climate change require a collective and coordinated response by the international community. Madam Moderator, our planet, our beautiful common home, cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as the mere place in which we live. Along these lines, in his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, Pope Francis appealed to each of us to alter the trajectory of environmental degradation by changing our patterns of consumptions, starting from individual behavior to national policies and also international multilateral agreements. In the wake of recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, it is fundamental to promote a culture of care in response to the individualistic and aggressive tendency of a throwaway culture. Additionally, given that much of the world's poor live in rural areas and depend primarily on agriculture for their daily subsistence, the discussion on climate change-driven poverty and food insecurity and migration cannot ignore the centrality of agriculture. Therefore, 
it is essential to find creative ways to invest in sustainable agriculture, including through international cooperation. The Holy See urges the international community and all stakeholders to adopt an ethical approach to climate change that inspires solidarity with future generations. Intergenerational solidarity is not optional. It is a basic question of moral justice. Without a global approach guided by ethical considerations, we are left with a system where some are concerned only with financial gain and others with holding on to or increasing their power, resulting in conflicts or spurious agreements where the last thing either party is concerned about is caring for the environment or protecting those who are most vulnerable. Madam Moderator, in recent years, the climate crisis and migratory, migratory displacement nexus has become increasingly evident, involving international as well as internal migration and displacement. In this context, the Holy See wishes to renew Pope Francis' urgent call for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. We need a conversation which includes everyone. Since the environmental challenge we are undergoing and its human roots concern and affect all of us. Within this conversation, it is important to acknowledge and understand the role of women and youth as innovators, as innovators to develop new skills and different approaches to old and new problems alike they become protagonists of development. In this regard, let me conclude with a question. Could the panelists share an example of how the role of migrant youth and women has helped their communities to mitigate the impact of climate change in local rural communities? I thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your remarks. On our list, we don't have no one else asking for uh, intervention for the floor. So for now, if there are no interventions, I will go. Oh, OK. There is the representative from Brazil. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I just want to say uh, a brief uh, example from our perspective. Since 2015, Brazil and FAO have established a partnership through the campaign Rural Women, Women with Rights, aimed at giving visibility to women who live and work in a scenario of structural inequality and social, economic, and environmental challenges. Unfortunately, the worst conditions of poverty are still found in the countryside, both in Brazil and in other countries. With a view to overcoming this situation, Brazil develops public policies to expand women's access to land, credit, and technical assistance. When it comes to youth, Brazil has implemented a national strategy for valuing family farming production through the attribution of this product of the seal of family agriculture. This seal, called SENAF, identifies and differentiates the products that come from the work of youth in family farming. These are but a few examples of the actions taken by the Brazilian government to strengthen the role played by women and youth in addressing the impacts of climate change, driven food insecurity, and migration and displacement. Thank you. Thank you very much for those remarks and for sharing the examples um, by the government of Brazil, which also responds to the question by His Excellency Ambassador Wachuku of the, of the Holy See. If there are no other questions here or online, then I will go back to the um, presenters to respond to the question. And maybe we start first with Ms. Snow online. 
-hmm. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and thanks so much to, to, to the other panelists and to the questions that have been raised. Um, let me start with some good examples. Um, and, and I think part of what's challenging in these examples is they overall tend to be relatively small scale. That's one thing we've observed in our reviews of the last uh, couple of years here. Um, but there are some good examples. Uh, one of those is in Niger, the efforts for regreening uh, and the planting of trees, over a million trees in each of, of the years, last few years. So um, in Burkina Faso, there's a, an effort for regreening the Sahel, um, and that they have been using a, a great deal of focus on agroforestry for rehabilitating the land and the soil. And those have been indeed uh, very uh, progressive in uh, focusing on the inclusion of women and young people. Efforts in the, in, since the turn of the millennium in Rwanda, um, I think it was land tenure was given to most of the small holding farms in, in 1999, many of which were, were women. Um, and the evidence now over these last 20 years is that those investments um, in sustainability and small holdings have been impressive and that there has been measurable improvement in, in sale, soil conservation. And, and there are other examples. I think that the challenge again is that where we see efforts in terms of biodiversity, green agriculture, there are excellent examples and many do include and focus on women and young people, but they tend to be at relatively small scale. And where we recommended in the context of the Commission on Population and Development last year was for a significant effort to try to take many of the more successful programs to scale and to look at South to South and replication opportunities um, so, that, so that there can be greater uh, success. I also just would would highlight that you know part of the you know interesting dynamic on on land tenure and for women in particular uh, brings us around to the importance of something um, as what may appear to be remote, but something like civil registration and legal identity issues. Um, and part of the advantage of having, for example, not only birth registration but marriage registration in this world for women, which tends to lag tremendously uh, still, is that it can help when women are widowed or women are divorced. And it may, can, can be terribly important for the retaining of land tenure, the inheritance of land, et cetera. So at something as uh, what appears remote of, of, of civil registration and birth registration and death and, and marriage registration, these legal processes, which may seem remote are terribly important for women's ability to hold on to land um, and to protect their families, et cetera. So I just wanna to make a, 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 an advocacy moment here that it's not only that we need more green agriculture efforts, et cetera, and mitigation uh, in, in terms of green agriculture, and, but we also need to assure that the legal stature of women it is brought forward so that they are not more insecure, uh, even from the land that they may have, have worked for decades uh, in the context of divorce or, or widowhood. Let me stop there um, and turn back to you, um, uh, Dr. Daniels, please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. And for highlighting these um, good examples. I think the point you make about it being small scale really reiterates the importance of um, a re policy response at the government level and that being able to be replicated nationally for it to be integrated into national adaptation plans for countries to be able to access the available funding um, to support um, rolling this out or scaling this up at a national level in line with the policy response. Thank you also very much for raising the role of legal identity as part of the solutions for women um, in being able to mitigate vulnerability, but also in terms of access to land. Legal identity is a, a, a 
top priority for us at IOM um, for, this, uh, for this reason. And now I pass over to Mr. Ante again for his response to the questions. I, um, for, first of all, I have to confess that uh, joining in a panel uh, with a group of powerful and eloquent uh, women is quite intimidating. <laughs> um, but, but in the spirit of, um, of highlighting the positive, um, the positive uh, stories, I would like to draw to your attention. Um, you know, I, I agree with um, my colleague uh, uh, virtually that, you, you know, youth are, are not only are part of the solution, but also they can create the solutions. Uh, for example, um, you know, I always talk about my case, uh, our case in Somalia. You know, our youth are, are, are fantastically dynamic and they are really pioneering quite a number of solutions. In every Friday, we have a group of uh, youth who volunteers uh, themselves and organize themselves and drone from different universities, uh, cleaning up the beach and also uh, collecting waters and driving all the way to miles and miles to people who are most affected. Uh, this, I mean, that demonstrates how sometimes the youth uh, are, are not only um, can be part of the solution, but also sometimes how they take up a leadership position. That is left prime, uh, that's left by, by the politicians. That's also left by, uh, by, by leaders who are elected. And also I agree with you that, you know, when we often say vulnerable and, and women, uh, women's or youth are vulnerable, vulnerability does not happen in vain or a vacuum. I mean, it's a condition that creates, and I agree with you. So how, how we address that conditions and how we create an enabling environment is, a, is a something that, uh, that we have to also discuss. I also, uh, I'd like to also remind to my colleague uh, uh, virtually that UNFPA is one of the biggest um, sort of a youth con uh, supporting uh, UN agencies in Somalia. And I've personally seen uh, quite a number of initiatives that they are supporting uh, to the youth and uh, giving the opportunity uh, to, um, you know, take their decisions in their hands, uh, whether in the policy levels or whether it's in the, in the private sector level. Another point that I would like to draw to your attention is the role of diaspora in Somalia. I mean, I don't know how, how, how familiar with you. So we have a, one of the biggest diaspora community in Horn of Africa, uh, making about a $2 billion annually uh, sending back home in remittances. And most of this money in, in the form of remittances are sent by uh, youth. They are coming from the youth. And, and this money are, are, are helping and contributing to, to the reconstruction of this state, supporting and building infrastructures that are, are needed. And you also have the diaspora also bringing back their skills from their respective uh, 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 countries. And these skills are, 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 are important to, um, to the state building uh, in Somalia. I mean, most of, too often, most of our cabinet, I mean, they are all of them, I would say almost 85% of the cabinet are one way or the other way come from diaspora. I mean, women and men who lived uh, outside Somalia for the last 30 years and have gained knowledge and, and, and insights and skills from their respective countries. So in generally, I, I agree with you that, you know, sometimes there are positive uh, stories that really needed to be highlighted. So let me stop here and then, and then hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ante, for um, presenting win-win solutions um, that the diaspora provide both in their, in the countries where they reside, but also in their, in their countries of origin. And the really critical role that youth are playing it's not just youth driven, these are youth owned um, solutions um, in, in your country. And now, um, again, last but not least, <laughs> I hand over to Ms. Quinones for her responses. Thank you. Uh, appreciating the, the examples that have been presented, I would like to offer um, two more, but Perhaps I think what the most important um, aspect of this conversation is to take into account that once uh, women and youth are integrated, outcomes in education, health, uh, political participation improve. And so I think we have to keep that in mind for building 
new ways of working, new ways of contributing with our work at country level. There's a partnership that UN Women has had with Barefoot College in India, where they, they train uh, women without formal education to be, to be able to develop solar lamps uh, with very um, low cost materials so that they can come back to their communities and offer solutions in climate, in climate distressed areas. This has worked very well in Guatemala where I was country representative uh, a year ago. And it, it's incredible not only the aspect of bringing the ability to have solar lamps in, in um, regions where you have droughts, where you have um, earthquakes, where you have volcano eruptions, but also how this transforms the situation of women at the community level. And we had several women who were formerly domestic workers, who were uh, in situations of uh, poverty, who are able to bring a livelihood to their families and to their communities, increasing their participation and their leadership. So that's uh, also a partnership that's very small, and we would really like to bring it to scale. Another example is um, the youth councils that uh, UN Women, I know UNFPA and other uh, UN organizations have um, in, in country offices where we are consulting young people on the work that we are doing. And it would be fantastic to focus on these particular topics. I think uh, the more and more training that young people are receiving and information and participation in decision making will, will enable them to be uh, building with us uh, a future with more sustainable responses to climate change, to, of course, to prevent uh, migration or to provide safe uh, migration pathways to all. Thank you very much, Ms. Quinones, for reminding us that investments in women and girls' education are among the smartest investments um, that, can ever, that can ever be made for, for families, for, for communities, and, and, and at the national level, and why it's so important for these to be done um, at scale. Okay, I'm just checking, do we have Okay, so if there are no more questions or comments, thank you very much um, to the panelists. I, maybe I'll give you each two minutes for any remarks you would have um, in closing. And I will go back to Ms. Snell. Rachel, are you there? I am indeed, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, first of all, to the panel and, and for trying to really get us to, to grapple with very complex issues that, that draw us into numerous sectors. Um, and, and, I, and I really appreciate the, uh, the effort to talk about challenging issues together here. I would just end perhaps on a, on a point of, uh, on data and, and population data and displacement and migration. And, and the data we have on, on migration, as we, we all know, is, is not very uh, sound in the sense that what we have is we have those who've been in other countries who are now in other countries. We know from the census uh, who who was born uh, in another country. So we have some solid estimates on international migration. But what we lack, of course, is is better data on, on the short-term displacements, um, many of those within a given country. And, and yet we know that that in fact identifies some of those who are most food insecure. Um, and and I, I just wanted to make a, um, let's say, a, a, a point of advocacy that we continue to invest together uh, in, in, a, in the data systems so that we can, with much more real-time data, be attuned to those who, who are, are, are indeed now in a situation where livelihoods are declining due to climate change and, and mobility is on the horizon. The, the estimated number of people who are going to be exposed to extreme or exceptional drought by 2050 is simply terrifying. It's very, it, I think the estimate is just under, under 400 million um, by 2050 in the direction we're, we're going now uh, in terms of climate change. I think we need more numbers where we need to be better at, at tracking what's actually happening in reality on the ground so that we can uh, indeed temper and mitigate accordingly. 
So thank you so much for, for, it was an honor to be here with you and I've learned a lot listening to my panelists. So thank you so much for, for bringing us together. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Rachel. And I think the last data point you shared about 400 million facing drought by 2050 is, is, is really startling and reminds us why the discussion we're having now is so, so, so um, important. Um, and now I hand over to Mr. Ante for his final remarks. I mean, just to uh, add what you say that also uh, in, in when you have nearly um, 6.5 or 7 million people who are at the risk of a looming famine, uh, it's also another uh, stark reminder of the situation that we, we are in. And most of these people are not all in numbers, not millions, but they are women, children, girls, boys, and they are really facing an acute and an appalling conditions. Uh, when we were visiting uh, in some of the hard hit area of the drought about a two month uh, ago, the situation was completely devastating and you could meet uh, young children uh, at the age of five, six, 10, uh, you know, their situation, it really, um, it really uh, clear uh, signal how sometimes we have collectively failed. And I think this uh, brings me to my next point, which is the upcoming COP27, which is uh, in due next month in Cairo. It's another important reminder that how we really need to act collectively and how we need to push our policy uh, uh, makers and policy uh, decision makers to really respond and, and act so that we bring a collective voice uh, at the center of the decision making and also we bring a real uh, and life-threatening uh, challenges that are happening across the world, uh, particularly in, 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 in Horn of Africa. So we are facing an existential uh, moment where people are really on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe uh, and, and these people are the most vulnerable people. Unfortunately, I'm keep repeating, but but I'm still stuck in the in the horrific pictures that I saw uh, a few months ago uh, in Somalia and, and the borderline between Kenya and Ethiopia. So uh, I thank IOM for really uh, organizing this, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, and I join in saying uh, uh, it's time to uh, act, and uh, and it's time we put our acts together and have a unified voice and, and uh, come with a one voice that would ultimately uh, give opportunity to the youth. So thank you so much, that's my. Thank you very much, Mr. Ante. And also for reminding us that it's not about the looming figures that we will face in the future. It's, it's the reality for many people right now, particularly what's happening um, in the Horn of Africa which just underscores why it's so important um, uh, collective action and, and solidarity and the venue and channel that uh, COP27 in November in, in Egypt this year, why it is so, so important an opportunity for us to collectively raise the issue of climate-induced migration and what that, uh, climate-induced migration and displacement and what that what that means. And now, Adriana, I, I turn to you. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to share with you that UN Women recently launched with UNDP a policy tracker on policy responses to COVID-19. And it looked, it had a sample of 5,000 policy responses. And it, uh, one of the results was that only 22% of the task forces created at national level to respond to the crisis integrated women, uh, that majority of the responses were to respond to women and girls who were suffering violence, but that only 0.0002% was invested on women and girls during the pandemic. So this should, this should tell us also uh, some lessons about how we can continue to engage in, within climate crisis, within migration, within internal displacement, on ensuring that uh, women and girls participate, and youth, of course. 
um, the issue of care, which is the l longer number of hours that women and girls invest in caring for um, their families, their children, uh, elderly persons, persons um, who uh, need special care needs to continue to be accounted for. The issue of new jobs that can be created now that we're seeing this um, new opportunities has not necessarily been addressed, but just to say that uh, we must learn from these experiences and not necessarily assume that these populations are gonna be integrated. So um, with that, I, I will finish to invite us all to continue reflecting on this topic. Thank you very much and uh, distinguished guests, please join me in appreciating the excellent remarks that we've had from our distinguished panelists, panelists today. I, I, I don't think a case needs to be made. I was trying to write down all of the zeros and the data point, the point zero, zero, zero. I don't think that um, there's, we need to make the case for why investments in, in women and young people are so, so important if we are going to get to solutions, if we really mean to get to the long-term solutions Mr. Ante um, spoke, um, spoke about, and what the reality is for people if we do not, as you said, get our act together um, and act for, um, for women and, and young people. So with that, I close this panel and once again uh, remind you to please um, download, uh, uh, take the QR code, download the um, policy note on people on the move in a changing climate, linking policy, evidence, and action, everything that we have spoken about today. Tomorrow there will be a panel um, dedicated, uh, well, the whole IDM is, is dedicated to this, um, but certainly the, the discussion will continue. But for now, with, uh, with great appreciation to all of you, um, this panel is over. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, DDG, and I'd like to remind all that the next panel is starting at 4.30. In 20 minutes, we are starting with the next panel. Thank you.